Harvey would like to welcome you to the Bermuda College Bermuda Environmental Sustainability Task Force final lunch and learn presentation of series three, The Perils of Plastic. We're delighted to have on this panel Dr. Robbie Smith, curator at the Bermuda Aquarium Museum and Zoo, who has been researching plastic pollution on and in Bermuda's beaches and oceans for a number of years. Eric Hetzel, chair of the Single Use Plastics Group. Eugene Dean of Green Rock, where a number of initiatives are underway to address the challenges of SUPs. And we're particularly pleased to welcome Zaria Ferbert, our very first student panelist, who will share findings from her very recent um, plastic use survey. Questions are welcome. Please use the chat, post them in the chat, and we'll open straight away with Dr. Smith. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for tuning in and to hopefully we can share some information about our plastic marine debris issues and uh, what we hope to do about it. So I'm gonna start by uh, sort of giving a bit of an overview about the distribution and sources of plastic marine debris around Bermuda, tell you some stories about some of the impact on our marine life and some of the research we've been doing. And I think most are fairly familiar with the idea that, you know, if plastic's in the ocean, somebody's gonna eat it. So this poor turtle living in Sargassum consumed an awful lot of plastic and it caused its death. Large pieces of marine debris like old fishing ropes and nets are a real risk for entanglement for many of our larger marine species. And we often find lots of plastic material which has been heavily chewed on by marine life. So if we think about the, the scale of the problem, it's pretty global. And we, we look at uh, studies done re relatively recently that give us the idea that somewhere between four to 12 million metric tons, which is a lot of plastic are entering our, our oceans every year. And when we look at the sources of that, it's pretty obvious that most of this plastic is coming from land. It's escaping from waste systems. It's, it's, it's on the ground as litter and it gets washed off by uh, storms and blown into the ocean. And it doesn't stay there. Now, the plastic leaves the coastline and, and drifts out to sea where oceanographic currents and winds concentrated in our oceanic gyres. We're in one of them, the Sargasso Sea. And a, a study done by Marcus Erickson, who went to visit all these gyres over a number of years, um, found that it was there. And uh, he estimates it's probably about 5 trillion pieces of plastic in our oceans today. And that may not be an accurate estimate. It might be a little on the low side. So when we think about the impacts, it's, they're very obvious ones are entanglement. We've seen uh, uh, whales past Bermuda covered in, in, in ropes, and we try to, to remove them if we can. Um, the idea of, of ingestion is, is a, a bigger challenge that as we begin to look more closely at the problem, uh, we understand there's a couple of different ways that plastic's getting into, into the mouths of animals in our ocean. Um, and also that the scale of the size of these particles of plastic is pretty broad. There's some are really, really tiny, well less than a millimeter in size, others a fair bit larger. So we think about two main modes by which uh, marine organisms go about uh, trying to find food in the ocean. We have filter feeders, you know, whether they're small like copepods or larger like fishes or big filter feeders like our humpback whales, a baleen whale or manta rays or basking sharks. They just open their mouths and go through the water hoping to get some food, but they end up with food plus plastic. And that is a challenge for their digestive system. Um, we will also look at many, many fishes and seabirds and turtles that are particle feeders. They see something and say, aha, that might be worth eating, and they eat it, and they find out it's plastic. And that's been a real challenge for many of our marine species. The emerging issue really is the fact that most of this plastic, particularly the fragments, has been in the ocean for a long time, on the order of decades. And it's sitting at the surface of the ocean, and it's in a sort of a soup of what we call persistent organic pollutants, mainly derived from herbicide and pesticide residues. So as this plastic material sits on the surface of the ocean, it's actually absorbing some of these contaminants. And what happens? That plastic gets eaten by somebody. And some of those digestive processes allow for those chemicals to leave that plastic and get into the animal's tissues. And if it begins to build up, that's potential to affect the health of that particular organism, causing disruption of, of, uh, of physiology and perhaps reproduction. So the issue is that one organism ate some plastic, gets eaten by somebody else, and then gets eaten by somebody else. And all of a sudden, you see what we call bioaccumulation of these or organic pollutants. In our, in, our, in our seafood, particularly in our fishes, and the potential for that to become a problem for our, the seafood that we want to enjoy, because we're at the top of the food chain, remember. 
So we know a fair bit about the plastic debris we find around Bermuda, uh, primarily from this one educational uh, institution, the SEA, that's headquartered in uh, in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And they have a ship that takes undergraduate researchers out, and they are going back and forth between the Caribbean and, and Woods Hole, and they stop in Bermuda. So they're always transiting through the Sargasso Sea. And this is a 20-year data set that they, they produce by taking this very simple tool, uh, it's called a noose to net, dragging it alongside the boat for a relatively short period of time, and then seeing what's in the net. And you know, their estimates of the density of plastic pieces is pretty astounding. That you know, pretty frequently they finding you know on the order of 100 to 200 thousand pieces of, of plastic in the ocean, and that's a lot. And it's where you would expect it. You know, there's not much found in the Caribbean Sea or along the coastlines of North America because it's all being pushed offshore and aggregating in our neck of the woods. So I've done a fair bit of work uh, looking with this with uh, another research vessel called the Sea Dragon. This is an example of one of our trawls. Um, sorry um, to interrupt, Robbie, but um, just wanted to let you know we couldn't see the full screen of the per per uh, PowerPoint. So oh. um, if you want to just click on that so we can see these manta trolls that you're talking about. I, um, my screen is completely full, so I'm so sorry that you're not oh, seeing no, it's, that. It's okay. I just I didn't want you to uh, not be able to showcase. Okay. Um, well, I, I have an illustration that I'm uh, sorry is this computer or, system is letting you see everything at this point. Um, yeah. Let me, does that help at all? Yeah, if you clicked down, we just couldn't see the PowerPoint full screen. Um, okay. We were, you were st still on the first um, slide. The first slide? Yeah, it wasn't clicking through. Ah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so here we are. Does that seem recognizable? Yeah, we, yep, no, yeah, I recognize that sea dragon and that manta troll. Um, okay. Yep. So, so what we're finding and what the SEA has found is, you know, all this plastic is pretty small. It's what we call microplastic, generally less than five millimeters in size. And here's an aggregation in one trough of, of only 57 particles. And if you do the math, the volume of water we filtered is about 25,000 pieces per square kilometer. And that's on the low end of scale. Let me see if we can get to the next slide. How does that one look, Amy? Uh, yep. It's just that you don't have it on presenter mode. I think that might be the issue. Well, it, it was before, so I'll try it again. How does that look? Um, it's still showing the um, side panel, but we can see it much better, and you're clicking through, whereas before it was just on that first slide. But at okay, least we can let me, see it now. Let me go back to here. Sorry, we, we tried this, but I guess we didn't try it well enough. <laughs> no problem. I just didn't want you to miss all that Im important information. Are you okay. for us to not see it? All right, so here Thanks we are so looking much. at... Okay. Uh, so another element of work that we've been doing here in Bermuda is looking at our um, the, the amount of plastic that strands on our, our coastline. You, can, you certainly understand that as the tide rises, it can leave a sort of a bathtub ring of, of plastic at the tide line. So we've been going back to a set of beaches here, four different beaches uh, from 2010 to 2016 with a small army of students and citizen science volunteers and looking to see what was left behind there. And this is the uh, results that we, we have found. And this is a, a measure, the number of grams of plastic uh, per meter squared of the tide line. And of the 99 samples, only one day we didn't have any plastic. But most of the data is falling between 0.1 grams to 10 grams of plastic per meter squared. There's quite a few days where it's much more than that and a number of days where it's much less than that. But it wasn't zero except on that one day. So what does that look like? Well, this is what this quantities look like. Here's a picture of a transect from John Smith's Bay. That looks like a lot of plastic, but it's only less than one gram per meter squared. Here's an example of 10 grams per meter squared. A small side story here is looking at one example of microplastics, and this is a picture of what are called pre-production pellets. This is what emerges from a, an oil refinery as a sort of raw plastic material that's shipped off to factories to be made into plastic items that we use in our consumer society. And what's interesting, we only found a few hundred in one transect, but we had some studies done here back in the 70s and 80s where they were finding thousands to tens of thousands of these nurdles or microplastic pellets um, on our beaches. So good news, the number of nurdles seems to have gone down. Bad news, we've got an awful lot of other plastics on our coastline. So with this understanding of so much plastic in our waters, it was interesting to try to figure out, well, who might be eating it? So I had a lucky to have a, a set of students, uh, Bermudian Shane Antonician and Giles Lorimer Turner and an American Ben Sacco was at BIOS and Justin Nathan came to me from the University of Algarve. The idea was to you know collect the fish, dissect the gut and see how much plastic is got in there. So if you look at an example of a planktivore like this redded herring, you know Shane had 10 fish and 40% of them had plastic in their guts. Uh, ben 
looked at 15, 87 had plastic in their guts. So for each individual species, we looked at 14 species, a total of 257 fish, 257 fishes, 42% had plastic in there. So it's pretty clear that plastic is a fairly constant uh, part of uh, these fishes' diets. So the question then is, who wants to eat all these fishes? <laughs> so in our beach surveys, we kind of excluded any what was what appeared to be obvious Bermuda marine debris. And so we had another opportunity to try to investigate how much Bermuda litter might be getting into our coastal waters, particularly in our inshore basin harbors. And this is an example of a data set from a tool called the sea bin, sort of an, an underwater trash can that was supported by Green Rock and Bank of Butterfield and established at the, uh, the dinghy club in, in, the, in the Hamilton Harbor. And the idea was to look at all the plastic material in there and decide based on its appearance, whether it's relatively fresh and new, you could read all the lettering, the color was good, it didn't look like it had been chewed up and had spent time at sea and sort of therefore qualify as being a Bermudian piece of plastic. And if you look at some of the percentages we have here for things like cigarette butts, at least 50% or more were obviously Bermudian. They were fresh, they, were, they had the paper on them. Whereas say bottle caps, um, maybe only 25% of, of uh, the caps that we captured there were Bermudian. So it's, it's pretty obvious that, you know, there's a, a reasonable amount of Bermudian litter getting into our waters and therefore we have some responsibility to try to change that condition. And so what are we going to do? Uh, we have a, a, an initiative uh, established by this government to try to start reducing and eliminating single-use plastic items by 2022. And these are excerpts from Minister Roban's speech he gave to the House earlier this year. And he's going to outline three phases by where we're going to try to move the, the, the dial in terms of um, how we use uh, single-use plastic items here. So in this first phase, which is kind of underway, we're going to establish more public information campaigns, have consultations with businesses, so you understand what we're trying to accomplish here, and also look help them understand what the alternative item might be for the things that they're probably going to be prohibited. So we expect to see a prohibition on the importation of certain single-use plastics by next year. That's the goal, to get, get started on here. So no, you can't bring them into the island. And also to make sure that if there are alternative products that they are not gonna be another environmental challenge that they're gonna be either biodegradable or potentially recyclable. In the second phase, we're gonna be looking at legislation that's gonna actually prohibit the sale, distribution, and use of these um, single-use plastic items. And there's a not, not really a clear time frame when that's gonna happen, but we wanna give businesses and importers time to use up what they already have on island. I, I don't know, we're not sure how long that's gonna take. In the third phase, the idea is to go back and look at how well the first two phases went uh, to decide, did we learn anything about how they were implemented and how people reacted to them? And then begin another round of consultation about the next sort of group of single plastic uh, use items that we hope to see banned by 2025. And you know, under, underpinning all this is a lot of public education campaigns about why we're doing this and what are the problems that are derived from single use plastics. So you can sort of understand a fairly simple list of familiar products to you that we hope to, to eliminate in time. Um, it certainly isn't the complete list and some will be easy and some will be problematic, but things like styrofoam products, uh, bowls, cups, plates, plastic utensils, plastic bags that are so ubiquitous in our retail industry, even plastic lined paper cups and fruit containers are not really you know, good to keep uh, in circulation here. These are kind of the low hanging fruit. These are things that uh, many retailers have already stepped up and said, hey, I can find a good alternative for that particular product and have already replaced it and given up some of the plastic bags as well. So that's where we're kind of headed. Now it's gonna take a lot of, work of us to, do, to, to make this happen. Uh, so just to summarize, we, we have a pretty pretty significant problem in front of us in terms of the amount of plastic in our oceans. It's gonna get worse uh, rather than in, in the short run because all the stuff's coming from land and that's where you have to solve the, the, the inputs. We understand that the level of entanglement and ingestion is pretty significant and that Bermuda is exposed to a fairly constant input of old microplastics. And a lot of them are getting into our fishes and I've also done some studies on some of our clams and oysters. We are concerned about the level of chemical contamination associated with the plastics. We don't really have any good measures of whether the chemicals are actually present in our fish tissues. That's another level of study which is underway in, around the world. Um, but we do understand that Bermuda produces plastic because we use it, it escapes from us as litter. And we have to you know, look at how we can do that. And I think the first steps will be a successful uh, reduction or elimination of our single use plastics. So that's it for me. I'm sorry the presentation was a little bumpy in there. Hopefully you got to see what I had to show. And I'm gonna pitch it over to Eric who's gonna continue some of the discussion. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Robbie. 
That was very informative. Um, and like Robbie, I have a lot of material to cover in a very short time frame. Uh, unfortunately, probably each of these slides, like Robbie's, could be broken into an hour-long presentation. But uh, we'll do the best we can here. So here we go. So I just want to start with a few stats. Um, so just for those of us that remember, there was no plastic or very little prior to 1950. Uh, global annual production is about 330 million metric tons. About 50% of that is used for single use. That means it winds up in the garbage. Uh, about a third of it is um, becomes plastic waste, basically. Mismanaged plastic waste means it winds up in open landfills or in the ocean. Um, that part that winds up in the ocean is about 8 million tons. That's about 2.5%. Uh, by 2050, it's estimated that there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Also, by 2050, plastic production may account for as much as 20% of petroleum. That's a huge number, and it's very important to remember that. Consumer packaging accounts for about 42% of plastic production. And if we think it's good now, it's supposed to double Plastic production is supposed to double in the next 20 years, so it's only going to get worse. And remember, plastic doesn't go away, not very quickly, hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. So plastics that you're familiar with, big stuff on the beach, that becomes very, very little stuff. Um, that becomes very, very small stuff. Um, important to know that there is something called primary nanoplastics, and primary nano nanoplastics are added as an ingredient to certain items, such as facial scrubs, cleaners, uh, lipstick, cosmetics. So you're getting exposed to plastics through this means as well. So the problem. The problem is people. And the people, we the people, are addicted to plastic. Now, plastic was introduced. It held, held great promise, still does. It's very useful. It is a wonderful miracle substance. But it's been overused and it's abused. And this is what happens to our plastic, 50% of it. It winds up in the garbage. And when it winds up in the garbage, it becomes a certain percentage of it becomes litter. Some of that litter winds up in the environment. And from there, we get to consume it. And each step along the way, that costs us money. So that's important to remember that it's already costing us money. Another important thing to fun fact is that we consume about five grams of plastic a week. So that's about a credit card's worth. Um, that's the estimate. That's not counting the leachate, so the chemicals that might uh, come directly out of that, say, plastic bottle. And that plastic bottle, by the way, if you crunch it up, and put it in a hot car, it's worse. So the manufacturers, part of the problem is the manufacturers like to pass the cost of this plastic and the problems of plastic onto you. So there's the trash costs, the litter costs, the healthcare costs, and the environmental costs that we kind of mentioned. In addition, if you live near a place where it's extracted or refined or produced, there's big environmental costs in those places as well. Now, there is something called extended producer responsibility that's being talked about now. This is important. We'll leave that for an entirely separate lecture about economics. Uh, there's seven kinds of plastics. I wouldn't really worry about it too much. Uh, one and two are really the ones that only ones that get recycled much. Um, all plastics have compounds in them that are probably not good for you and unhealthy and maybe worse. Which brings me to the effects of plastics on human health. So plastics and the additives and or compounds in the plastics are implicated in neurological problems, cancers, birth defects, skin rashes, hormonal changes, ulcers, resp respiratory issues, thyroid problems, cardiovascular disease, infertility. That's And this is the short list, by the way. So let's talk about infertility for a moment because there's a very controversial, it's going to be controversial, I think, book that just came out. Uh, it was written by Shana Swan, PhD epidemiologist. Um, 
it was based on research that she co-authored in 2017. Uh, you'll see the titles there. The I'm going to just share one stat that comes out of that book, and that shows a 52% decrease in sperm concentration in Western males. Um, if you extend that line, she if it was a straight line, and it has been a straight line apparently, um, if it keeps extending, that means that Western population will be functionally infertile by 2045. So this is important. I'd suggest anybody that has any interest in this, get the book and read this study. Now, to be fair, and so everybody doesn't, you know, completely worry about this, um, there are multiple causes of uh, fertility problems, uh, genetics, environment, lifestyle is very big, talks in this book, she talks a lot about lifestyle factors, so it, there are other factors involved, uh, but chemical exposures are a big one, and something called endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are some of the chemicals that are found in plastics they are implicated in this. So plastics may play a role in this declining fertility. Um, just to talk very briefly, uh, there's phthalates that are found in them, in plastics, and there's something called bisphenols. Those are also implicated in a host of diseases all by itself. The pro big problem is a lot of these chemicals don't come solely by themselves. You got to remember, it comes as a soup. Uh, you get multiple things all at once. There's a regulatory challenge. Um, you know, the regulators try to keep up, but frankly, they can't. Uh, so it's a bit like whack-a-mole. I have a friend that works at the EPA. He said that's a pretty good description. Um, so don't count on the regulators to kind of keep up. Unfortunately, you kind of have to pay attention to yourself. Now, what do we do? Um, unfortunately, burning is not a good solution because that releases particles into the air and compounds into the air. Recycling would be great if it actually was available here, maybe, but then in the real world, um, plastic recycling doesn't work. Only 9% of plastic gets recycled anyway. So recycling has just turned to, you know, into another way for manufacturers to pass costs onto you, unfortunately. So recycling is really not a good solution. So back to the point that 50% of the plastics are used for single use. So BEST has kind of focused on that. Uh, we asked in a position paper that the plastic bags be banned, straws be banned, cutlery be banned, cups, plates, bowls, lids, and takeout food containers all be banned. The government appears to have uh, agreed with most of that. We'll have to see what, the, what it actually looks like. As Robbie aptly explained, it's about the consultation now. Um, so we'll have to see, but this was our list. What can you do? Um, basically, we have to start now. Uh, don't wait for any bans. Um, we should try to end our plastic addic addiction. Uh, tell your stores, tell your restaurants, tell the manufacturers that you don't want any more plastic because uh, you as a consumer, you have power. Um, if you refuse a piece of plastic, then that message gets back to the manufacturers. Even though we're a small place, it, we're part of the solution. The other thing is to replace and reuse. So use uh, cutlery that's reusable, tiffins or some other kind of reusable container for your takeaway. Um, maybe switch to a um, you know a fiberboard kind of container. Uh, use rather than using plastic wrap, use a uh, bees wrap, uh, use takeaway, you know, a permanent um, reusable bag, and use a regular cup for your coffee. Um, you can also take your own container to the store. Some stores are uh, accepting those, some are welcoming it. Uh, tell people what you're doing. That's really important. When you, as you go down this road, be very careful about greenwashing. That's something where if you stick a green leaf on it, make a green label, that it all looks good and it's supposedly healthy. Um, unfortunately not. So like that cup is probably lined with plastic. That um, container, food container in the middle, even though it might say uh, compostable, it's not compostable in Bermuda. It's made maybe of a bioplastic, but when it winds up, especially in the marine environment, it's not going to break down 
it's it's basically just plastic. Uh, same thing with the cutlery and the container on the right. Again, avoid anything. Just be careful of anything. It's got a label on it that claims to be friendly. Um, now, this is unfortunate situation here about these uh, compostable food containers that are becoming very popular now. They hold great promise, and this will be part of the solution, um, these non-plastic containers. Unfortunately, a lot of them right now are covered or coated with something called PFAS, um, and that's a suspected carcinogen. Some of them are. Uh, some have been banned in some places. Some will be banned in some places. Um, this is a hot topic of conversation. So we have to, unfortunately, also be careful about these compostable fiber containers. So BEST is part of a group called Beyond Plastic Bermuda. Please follow us on Instagram. We'll put up some infographics there on occasion. We're going to try to provide more information as we move forward on the consultative process. Um, so to wrap up, please reduce your plastic when and where you can. Nobody's perfect. Nobody can do it all the time. We understand it's very difficult. Talk to your friends. Talk to your stores. Talk to your members of parliament. Support, please support any ban on plastics that does come into play, into force. Um, if you really want to try something, consider a plastic-free week or month. That'll really bring home the problem to you. So refuse, reuse, and replace. And that's me. I'm going to turn it over to Zaria. Sorry, uh, sorry, if you could just unmute. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I did a community-based public um, survey um, of single-use plastic. So with the help of Ms. Harvey, I had on a total of 627 participants and I had a total of 20 questions. So my service, um, my survey demographic was 77% um, um, women, 20% men, men, and 1% non-binary, and 0.6 preferring not to state. While um, I did release my survey on social media and via email, I was expecting a larger response from the age group of 16 to 24. But in response, I got a large response from the 45 to 54 and the 65 and older. Um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Could you just um, make it full screen so we can see your um, your wonderful slides? So if you can just click um, the uh, slideshow presentation and oh, just it, go to full screen. Is it showing now? Uh, nope, not, not in full screen. Oh. Do you see the slideshow up the top? Oh, yeah. Perfect. How about now? Uh, well, it's still in, um, it's on your current slide, but it's not full um, as it could okay. be. But at least, we're, at least it's clicking through now, so. Okay. Uh, Is it just full screen now? No, if you can just go down because we can't read everything now. Okay. I think is you have to click from uh, current slide to make it bigger. Okay. You see at the top. The joys of technology. <laughs> I'm not really sure what's going on, but if you just go scroll down or sorry, zoom out again because now you've gotten it so big we can't read anything. And maybe okay. just pull it over like Dr. Smith did so we can't see those side slides. We'll see more of your main slide. That's better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> so I'll start from the beginning. Um, I had a total of 627 participants with my survey. Um, it was a community based, so I wanted to have a response from the community and how they feel about single use plastic and the relationship. So I had a total of 627 responses. Um, 77% was identifying as a, as women and 20.9% 20, 20 was identifying as man, a man and 1% non-binary and 0.6 preferring not to state. 
um, I was expecting like majority of my responses um, to be from the 16 to 24 um, range, but I got actually a large response from 45 to 54, 19.9%. Um, with my so with my survey reaching um multiple social media platforms and email, it was um over, over, quite overwhelming with the response that I got. So, with the relationship of the single use plastic, I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of the single use plastic ban in the third speech of 2019, 2018, and 41, 41% participants did not know about it, which was kind of alarming. Um, I feel like the reason why they didn't is because the third speech is quite outdated and not reaching multiple platforms like social media. Um, maybe the newspaper, I think it was released in the newspaper, so I think that's why most, like, most of my participants knew about it. Um, I wanted to know the relationship of if the public believes that the government's doing enough, and 70% actually said no, and 26.8 said yes, which was like, okay. Um, which is kind of putting more stress and more importance on the government and understanding that the community is aware they're just waiting for the initiative of the government to do so. Um, yes, COVID, it's still a thing. So hopefully by 2023, we'll be able to have some type of transparency of what um, the next steps are in vetting um, single use plastic. So I, the next question was, um, are people willing to do more with the with the relationship of single use plastic and it um, affecting the environment? Um, Seventy nine point nine percent said that they're using cloth or reusable bags while grocery shopping, so that is um, a great habit that the island is currently in. While twelve 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 percent is using plastic bags provided by the grocery stores. So hopefully, we can stop using plastic bags in grocery store and maybe use brown or biodegradable, just trying to, you know, get rid of that plastic and get you out of that habit. Um, my next question with my survey was, what ideas are people more most interesting in? And <laughs> true Bermudian fashion, um, people said they want a reduction in a, um, in a purchase of price of a reasonable bag, a cup or a bottle. So that shows that, you know, people are willing to do so if it is if of monetary benefit. Um, and then 22.3% said they're willing to pay an extra charge, which shows that people are not, you know, if it's there, people are willing to use it, which is a great benefit for um, many companies if they need more insight in the relationship within the community. And then my next question was the barriers that are presenting people to use single use plastic and time is not an issue for most people. Um, how expensive reasonable prices are and products. Um, hopefully people will realize, or the government can realize that companies who do bring in single use um, reasonable products can get hopefully last taxes on it just so we can get the community into the habit. I think habit is the main focus that the community can focus on, which is not using plastic bags, um, getting rid of takeout items and things like that. Um, my next largest response was others. So some people were just saying that they are in the habit, but some companies aren't in the habit. So it's a mix of responses that I got, which was great. And it shows that it's there. Um, yeah. And then some solutions to single use plastic and the ban. So Australia and Ireland were some of the first two countries to introduce single use plastic, I mean, a single use ban. And then, for example, Barbados in particular, in January 1st, January, January 1st, 2020, they actually introduced the ban that was effective. Um, currently, the island is doing great. Um, COVID was not a excuse for the country to lack and the environment. Um, hopefully, we can use them as an example towards, you know, banning these importation and distributions and sales of single-use plastic. Um, 
my second solution would be more education. So as everyone drives, um, the marketing plan with the buses, that's a great example of what we can do. And then a recycling plant in Bermuda for plastic. Um, we are an island that we don't recycle. We It's just something that we can move towards and have a better advantage and hopefully build a stronger relationship with the community with single-use plastic and um, preventing it. But thank you for everyone watching my presentation and I'll turn it over to Eugene Dean of Green Rock. All right, greetings everyone. Give thanks for the opportunity to speak. It's been some great presentations so far. I was asked to participate because Green Rock has been involved with raising awareness and seeking to affect change around single-use plastics for many years. I started with this slide because it showed that two decades ago, um, or more than two decades ago, globally, plastic had already established itself as a huge issue. And this is a statement that was made by the Department of Trade and Industry in London. We are now going through a sustainability revolution that will rival the agricultural and industrial revolutions in the way that it will transform society. Innovation and creativity will be needed to develop radical new products and processes that are less damaging to the environment and generate new businesses and jobs. So around 2012, we started with our first campaign around single-use plastics. And first we started off with a bring your own bag campaign. Um, the first thing that was highlighted was obviously all these single-use plastic bags in the grocery stores. So that was kind of like a low-hanging fruit, a very easy target. And then we went on to a bring your own bottle campaign, which was raising awareness about getting beyond the single-use plastic water bottles as that water bottle revolution, plastic water bottle, bottle revolution was started. And Eric talked about it, the health effects in his presentation, but we had one of these things in our campaign, which was letting people know about the harmful chemicals that are in the bottles that contain the so-called fresh water that comes from mountains and streams and things of that nature. They always make that look very good, but at the end of the day, plastic is made from byproducts from oil. Um, and so that's, that's never going to be something that's good for your health. In 2013, we started to ramp up. We did a lot of work with KBB and the Bermuda Marine Debris Task Force, which had recently formed. And one of the first things we did was submit a petition letter to cabinet. And we went into the environment and economic development and public works ministers and departments saying the time is right for Bermuda to reduce the demand of single use bags. These bags are a source of litter, a drain on the economy and potentially a health hazard. One in four countries charge for single use bags. Green Rock supported by the Bermuda Marine Debris Task Force believes that Bermuda, with its limited resources and fragile environment, has more reasons than most countries to join this global initiative. So we started already with that. Again, focus on the single-use plastic bags. And then we put a whole proposal together, you know, just inspiring the government to act to reduce the waste of single-use grocery bags and make a positive contribution to Bermuda's economy send a message to our visitors that we care about our environment and we're willing to you know, protect it and have a positive impact on you know, the environment locally and globally. So, and again, we did this with KBB and the Bermuda Marine Degree Task Force. We sponsored this whole campaign. So the conclusions were as follows. Bermuda needs to act to reduce demand for single use paper and plastic bags for economic and environmental reasons. We're already lagging the rest of the world and doing something to affect change in this area. Education has been shown to have only a small effect on behavior, while legislation has been shown to reduce demand by 70 to 95%. 
at least 37 other countries and 16 U.S. states have introduced legislation to restrict single-use bags, and we need to do the same here. So again, just a reminder, this is all in 2013 that we were doing this, and these stats are from that time period as well. We then went a bit further, and we announced the launch of a, the No Thanks campaign music video, and we started to use videos. We actually had a whole public service announcement campaign that was running all at the same time as well. So we started to get into more like social media. We had our Green Rock, I guess our YouTube channel, showing all these videos. We were running commercials on all the networks, encouraging people to use their own reusable bags. So I'll show you this video right now. <laughs> Do you need a bag? Plastic, please. Well, let's set up a scene. We're telling you what there is. Plastic just isn't green. Got a blue sign and not a blue sign. If you want to look closely. When I'm pressing down, for your groceries. This is what I'm saying. Don't mean the name, but I say it's a trend. Put on your swag, which we do. It's a fun fact. Come on, get with the movement. Say no, get the blessing. Say now nah, it's cool, never mind. When you put me in the check, don't intend to show a breeze. That mess don't belong in the sea. Say now nah, it's cool, never mind. When you put me in the check, when you put me in the check, when you put me in the check, I'm gonna tell you just what I mean. What you mean, what you mean? When I say Palestine, Palestine, I'm gonna pass you that piece of shit. Cut down brown trees together. Now recycle the plastic bags instead. We come to fight, just to play and sing the fight. Use some of the bags, make you a superstar. Come on, get with the movement. Say no paper on that set. Say now it's cool, I won't mind. When you put in the checkout line, where that dread to all agree. That dread don't belong in the sea. Say now it's cool, I won't mind. When you put in the checkout line, when you put in the checkout line, when you put in the checkout line, when you put in the checkout line. Plastic for the killer group of a buggy. Now, why you're living the blue like smuggy? When you take it on the ocean, you have it. You let the power you have it, and look bloody. Things say you can dash plastic away. But plastic, you dash my money, see if you stay. End up somewhere at the end of the day when a landfill, or when a long church lay. When I do to put the night in the rear, no matter what they have in the atmosphere. Yeah. People are the lamb, you can do much better. Oh, and now I'll be this plastic monster. Now I'll be this plastic monster. Now I'll be this plastic monster. Taking care of the environment starts with you. Say no thanks to single-use bags and bring your own. Don't kid yourself. You make a difference. Okay, so that was a fun video that we produced. And remember, all of this is from about 10 years ago that we were working on these things. And you see the pictures that are even in the video of the amount of plastic that's in the, in the water. And based on Eric's presentation, the rise in plastic production and plastic use, you can only imagine what the situation is like now. So then I, I found something in our archives also, whereas we had sent some suggestions to government in 2017, the government in 2016 and the Thurin's speech was talking about, you know, doing work to maintain Bermuda's pristine 
environment and taking measures to protect the environment against local and even global sources of pollution. So we submitted nine initiatives for the government to consider at that time. You know, one of them was charging for plastic and paper bags, talked about helium balloons, microbeads, minimized plastic on the beach, fishing line bins at public docks is interesting. I was just watching a video last night about um, sea shepherd. It's a, it's, it's a group and, and they just acquired another boat out in the Mediterranean sea, pulling up like kilometers of old fishing lines and fishing nets and things of that nature that are wreaking havoc on marine life because they've just been left in the water and just catching fish and, and tangling fish up and things of that nature. So installing drinkable water sources at public beaches, banning the firm packaging, supporting marine treaties, which reduce marine plastic pollution, and just a whole general awareness campaign. And again, this was in this was five years ago. So just fast forward to 2021. And what we're really focusing on is is getting people to think beyond plastic. And Eric mentioned a group Green Rock is involved in that collaboration as well with other environmental NGOs about working towards raise awareness and, and putting systems in place that have helped to reduce our dependence on plastic. But it's going to require all of us to get involved because all of this is, is coming from humans impact. And what I would just say is a lot of times we try to find ways to replace current behaviors with new behaviors. And my suggestion to everyone is that we have to think completely differently. The way we've been doing things, that's all been based on convenience, driven by products that are put into the market without any social or environmental consciousness, you know, or consideration that have been put in just for economic benefit, we need to rid ourselves of those products. They don't serve us in any way. They're bad for our health, they're bad for our environment, which is our threat to our health. We need to think and start being willing to do things totally differently. And that's gonna require more effort on our part because being responsible requires effort. Doing things easy and focusing on convenience only leads to more destruction. So it's a whole mindset that needs to shift. So yes, it's gonna be more difficult, but we have very good reasons why. We're stewards of the earth, we're responsible for it, the earth sustains us. We shouldn't even really have to be having these conversations about why we need to be doing things in harmony with nature, because without nature, we don't exist. And we also have to think about future generations and what we passed on. What will be our legacy? And what role did we play in addressing to the challenges we face today? Or contributing to the challenges that we're creating for future generations? So. I would just ask everyone to just think beyond plastic. And that's the solution for taking us into a next phase where we can find ourselves rid of the harmful effects that, or the perils that plastic has caused in our community. So give thanks, I'll pass it back over to Amy now. Thank you, Eugene, and uh, just give me a, a, a minute to add everyone back, um, uh, and that takes a little bit of time. Just be patient. I think that's everyone now. Um, so thank you, everyone, for those brilliant presentations um, from Dr. Robbie Smith, Eric Hetzel, Zaria Ferbert, and Eugene uh, Dean, who finished us off um, with the final thought of just trying to move beyond plastic and how do we go about now create an action because we all know it's a problem. Zaria's um, survey showed that everyone knows, everyone's aware, but we just need to do now. So um, we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience and open up to panel discussion amongst us. Um, but I also just wanna have a quick uh, shout out and thanks to those uh, groups um, that were mentioned who have been um, you know, at the forefront of this problem for decades now. Um, so KBB, the Bermuda Marine Debris Task Force, Green Rock and BEST, um, to name a few. Um, and thank you all for all, all your hard work. Um, so we'll leave it uh, open now for discussion. Um, a question for Zaria. Why or how 
your survey showed that there was very little response from the male population. Um, how do we go about encouraging men to look at this as a um, manly thing? Perhaps they're looking at it as a, a not a very manly thing to be thinking about. What are your thoughts, particularly with regards to um, young young men that you will have more association with? College? Um, I believe that it was just the reach, the, like the um, total reach I got. So if I had a larger like time period and a social media platform, I think I would have gotten like a better response because like many of my peers are aware of it and they are conscious of what they do and their habits. It's just the time period and how far I got with my reach. So I know my generation is and my age group is aware of it. It's just we're more <laughs> focused on getting the change done. It's just how I reached out to um, certain participants for it. Okay, I, I would compliment you on it. I think you reached a lot of people in a very short space of time. I think you did very, very well. It was a very good survey. Thank you. Jennifer, if I could just say something on that. I think it's a real societal thing that we need to look at. You know, the reality is, is that the most part, men are responsible for the problem that we have for plastic because men society have been responsible for driving forward industry and building enterprise and women on the other hand are the ones who are primarily advocating for support because women are the ones who are dealing with nurture and children and things of that nature so they will be first hand on the side of the health impacts and things of that nature so what i've seen and it's been very encouraging to me is that a lot of the advocacy around things in his nature is coming from women, you know, and, and men need to face up to the responsibility role that we play in creating this mess and step up and support the women in their efforts to bring solutions. So I think it's a challenge in many regards, but it's, it's breaking through these societal norms that, you know, would allow us to achieve that. So that, that's what I would say to you. Mm. I think it's also an, a, a bit of a, uh, maybe a generational thing. Um, and I think Zari is right. I think a lot of the young generation are involved in doing, and I think I could be mistaken, um, but the one of the KBB Youth Awards went to a young male who now has his own um, action group around doing cleanups. And right. actually some of my students were involved in that and they were males too. Um, so I, I think it could be generational. I know like my dad, so to speak, not to throw him under the bus, but you know, he's just like, what's this all about? Um, but so how do we reach, how do we reach them all, you know, all sectors? Sorry, Robbie. I think that the point is that we're looking at a phase of important public education. So we have to look at how people get information. So if old males only read the World Gazette, well, give it to them in the World Gazette. But if lots of younger people have five different social media platforms, then they'll they'll get that information that way. So as long as you recognize that not everybody receives or gathers or processes information the same way, then it allows you to design the engagement program to be hopefully more effective and reach more people with information the right way, with the right language that clicks that switch and says, okay, yeah, this isn't going to be too difficult. I'm sure I can do it. I see all the benefits without a whole lot of challenges or risk or penalties. So I'm encouraged that if we understand that, we can figure out a way to, to reach people no matter how old or what they're doing in their life, including your dad. I know. I'm working on them. I'm working on them. Um, but um, a question, or just something that came out of Zaria's survey, um, which uh, kind of segues into the solutions and something that Green Rock is working on with the uh, Green Bowl initiative. But there was a lot of interest from the survey. Um, and sorry, you can back me up on this in terms of getting the retailers to provide products that don't have as much packaging, as well as the like takeout. That was another big theme. Yes, takeout um, was the biggest theme yeah. among, among people. Like a lot of a lot of my responses were based on the takeout and just that they want to do so. Like they'll say no plastic utensils or no plastic bags or just carry out on their hands. So I feel like if we can get more um takeout retail retailers to introduce um, more plastic-free or biodegradable um, takeout containers, that'll be a great push forward. And hopefully we 
can start getting people into the habit of bringing their own containers. But I know with COVID, many um many restaurants like Buzz or Take Five is not doing um reusable containers like bring it in. So hopefully, once we get COVID under control, we can start re re reintroducing that to many other restaurants. And maybe Eugene, you can speak to your green bow. Yeah, can we? Yeah, I know. Okay, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. So there's a bit of feedback. Oh, it's a feed for me. I think maybe. Oh, I'm sorry. A little bit of feedback for me. Let me see. Um, let's see if I can change my. All right, did that help at all? No. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So I can go ahead now? No. Yeah. I still. Oh, I see you. Can we mute? The rest of us who aren't speaking, would that help? Mm -hmm. Yep. If, if... Yeah, maybe somebody else is in. Because it was fine during my presentation, right? All right. Well. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, Eugene is coming from you because everyone else was yeah. muted. Oh, uh, he is coming from me. Uh, my apologies, but you, you can do it once so I can try to sort it out and see if you can, um, but let's see. Okay, is this your feedback now? No. Yeah, it's still quite bad. Uh, okay. I'll just mute you for a second and we'll... Um, yeah. We'll just uh, right, no try and fill in the gaps. So um, just to fill in the gap of the Green Bowl initiative that Green Rock's trying to push forward. And actually, sorry, Eric, you could probably speak better to this, um, maybe um, through your Beyond Plastic community, uh, sorry, committee. Uh, but trying to get uh, retailers to have reusable takeout containers um, that they um, will provide for the public. Um, the public can put a deposit on it. Um, return it, get their money back, or just keep reusing that container. Um, but I think Zaria's survey kind of um, confirmed that there is interest and that the public are wanting to use reusables and are interested in having a monetary incentive um, to to um, be rewarded, I guess, for their good behavior. So maybe some <laughs> other people would like to speak to that. <laughs> well, that's a great result by Zaria. I mean, we were... That's very encouraging to hear. And certainly that's one of the solutions that we're looking at and going to propose most likely um, is some kind of uh, reusable container that maybe comes back and forth to the uh, stores and restaurants because um, it works in other places and it can work in Bermuda. Um, to be a little bit, again, careful about the cost because we have to remember that we're already paying a cost right now. So we may not dip into our pocket at the at the uh, lunch counter and you know pay a little bit more but we're already paying you know in costs you know so you have to be careful mm -hmm. just because they're hidden doesn't mean they don't exist hmm. so a is, question is that a little bit better amy oh yeah that's much better, better. Much, much better yeah could we answer that question though yeah, so a question just came yeah, in nope. from the public. Um, are there well-publicized studies on the health implications of plastic on um, endocrine disruption that can be easily referenced? So if anyone has a reference uh, that can be shared, that would be great. Yeah, there's a, there are a plethora of studies now. I mean, if, if there's a problem in this field, um, it's almost that there's too much information. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's – you can – it's we'll compile a list and put that up on the Beyond Plastics site, um, but you can easily Google. You know, mm -hmm. the only thing that's difficult is there's so many chemicals involved in some cases, and um, so yeah. But even even that confusion doesn't limit us to be able to make the steps necessary to try to take the precautionary approach. You know, find a way to get plastics out of our out of our environment, out of our diet, 
and then you have less to worry about. We don't need to wait till we all find out that we shouldn't have been ingesting this much plastic for as long. And if plastic uh, water and plastic uh, takeaway bottles is a source, then people need to be aware of that because there are alternatives for that, uh, both here and, and at a global level. So it's good for people to be informed, but you know, waiting for absolute hard concrete evidence um, is going to take time. So let's not wait. Let's just move ahead with what we know we can do to try to limit the amount of plastic in our environment and entering in our bodies. Mm, absolutely. Um, well, I was just going to say, at, at the end of the day, right, we, we, we can sit around and wait for somebody else to solve the problem. We, we, can, we can sit around and wait for people to make things easy for us. What, what we need is people who actually care. That's, that's the difference. Because when you care about something, you'd be willing to do whatever it takes to achieve it. And that's the difference. So we've become so laid back and so nonchalant. I mean, if you just look at some of the images that were in these presentations, like we actually need more convincing about plastic. I mean, it's everywhere. It's, I mean, I mean, just go on your computer, go on your phone and just Google search plastic pollution. And then you'll see countless images. And, and the, the challenge is so big. It's so it's difficult to even see our way out of it. Like, we just need to stop it. And this is where legislation comes in and why, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, government becomes critical in the process, you know, because people tend to do things when they have to. Mm -hmm. You give people the choice, they look for the easy way out. And so we're trying to find an easy way to make the situation, there is no easy way. Sorry to disappoint you. Mm. It's actually going to be difficult and we're actually gonna to have to work for it. So it needs to start from caring. And that's where I say the difference with men and women a lot of time, a lot of men just don't care. They, they, they haven't applied themselves to it in a way where they're really interested in it. They're focusing on like society has been geared in a way where we just look at economics. There's no conscientiousness about environmental impact, health impact, as advanced and progressed as we feel we are, we've regressed so far, hmm. you know, because we've become narrow-minded. We're not thinking comprehensively. You know, we make products that go into the market that make a lot of money and have impacts that we don't take responsibility for. And then we actually praise the people who make the money. So I guess what I'm going at is like, it's really like a mindset issue that we have to shift, you know, and it starts from just caring, you know, so. Yep. Yeah. If I can just add in there as well, um, there's going to be, a, I, f I think, and I fear, a big push by companies to promote plastics because they are losing their market in selling gas um, with electric cars and such like and so forth. And already we're seeing companies like, I believe it's Shell, setting up factories to make more plastic probably single use items. And while those don't impact directly on Bermuda, I think we have to take some responsibility for what is happening in those other com com um, areas. I think Eric or Robbie touched briefly on it. If you're, where they're setting up factories is in areas where people are already disadvantaged. There are probably already many factories around them. Yeah. They're already struggling with the pollution that comes from those factories. and the, and while we may not see it, if we continue to support a market selling these um, single-use plastics, we are harming other people. And I think we really need to think about the, the big picture, as Eugene was saying. Yeah, and just to, just to kind of piggyback on that, you said, um, Eugene, you need to Google to see pictures and whatnot. You don't need to Google, you just walk out your door, right? You walk out your door and it's on my doorstep. And I, you know, I obviously try not to use plastic, but it's right there, it's out of my control. Um, you go on the beach, it's there. We've seen it, Robbie and I, and Zari was part of the surveys. It may look like a pristine, beautiful Bermuda beach, but you look up close and it's covered in microplastic. Um, so it's there, we see it. Let me ask Zaria whether she noticed anything in the, your questions about you know what people observe in their in their neighborhoods did did you get a sense that people were attentive to the fact that they had plastic around them or did um yes they were very attentive that they, they do have plastic in their communities um I think um most of them knew like you know they only cared if it was at the beach and if they see it um 
Are we on like the side of the road or in a park? I think the beach was like their main influence of you know picking up plastic and reducing their habits. I mean, you know, that the more people are, are aware, and as your survey showed, people are attentive to it, it's going to be easier. I think we're going to help achieve what Eugene wants us to aspire for, caring about things. And yeah. people don't need any convincing. They just need that. I think the sperm count <laughs> graph will definitely gauge that uh, man's attention. Um, yeah, and it's, for real. it's a real factor. You know, whatever it is, and there are many factors that can influence that, men need to understand that you know, what goes in their body is going to have an effect um, on their ability to reproduce, and that's you know that's a significant factor. It uh, you know, really does affect our fertility rates in our in our society. And Western society, so yeah, yeah, Western um, society. Which, and we're the ones that are consuming the most, um, eighty percent, right? Twenty percent of the population, but eighty percent of the problem. Um, so it's coming so back to world, us. The Western world is less than twenty years behind us. They'll catch up soon enough because well, you know, the quantity of plastic in their environment is just beyond what we're experiencing here. So mm -hmm. I've yet to see that, but it's going to, yeah, we can't wait. We, we've got to get, get busy and, you know, we're one community and a lot of other communities and we're not alone in trying to make these changes. Um, it's more difficult in some countries than, than others, um, but we, we've got to be inspired and inspired by what other people are doing. I think, you know, what, you know, Eugene pointed out earlier that, you know, Barbados, no, sorry, Zaria said that, you know, Barbados had made this change. Well, there are many other small island nations in the Caribbean that have done this. They're way ahead of us. We're behind the curve. And that was the motivation for this government. Wendy, I'll call you back. back. I'm in a meeting. Sorry. <laughs> Where's that mute button when you need it? <laughs> anyway, so, you know, I think uh, good stories uh, percolate around. And as you know, we make su success, that'll help another island jurisdiction, maybe not in our ocean, but somewhere else to think about, yeah, we, we, we got that issue coming. If it's not here now, it's going to get here eventually. So we can inspire yeah. each other to try to make these changes. Yeah. Yes, we're all in this together. So every little bit that we do, like uh, Robbie said, has a global impact. So we have to realize it's more than just the individual. It's about the whole world, caring about it, as Eugene said. Yeah. Well, Dr. Robbie, I'd say we've already made it. I heard you say we can't be because I'm looking at our campaign that started, you know, in 2012. Yeah. So it's almost 10 years later and, and we're still waiting. So we've already waited. We're already so far behind. The, the, the issue was a huge challenge then. You know what I mean? So that, that's where I'm talking about the legislation part because, yeah. you know, for the most part, people were just, it's not on my doorstep. Until you take a truck full of plastic and dump it right on somebody's doorstep, they don't realize there's a problem. Yeah. That's just the reality. Yeah, you know, we have blinders. We're, we're, we get yeah. things on and we don't see it and we don't, don't appreciate it. But, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, Best had a, a really good productive um, uh, intern, uh, Sophie Collis, who sort of went around to look at our retail takeout in, um, uh, industry and sort of get information about what they're doing and, you know, are they thinking about it? And, and there really is some 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 movement. You know, a lot of the retailers have, have heard their customers and have thought about it. And, you know, the, in the packaging world, this, this is not something they don't talk about. It's like, how do we keep on packaging things in ways that will be useful rather than contentious or problematic packaging? So it's there's other opportunities. I think we've made progress in here. That's why I think in Zaria's surveys, people are, are aware of it because we've seen some changes already. We're a long way to go. And the legislation is a key part of this. And I, I'm sure the government is committed to making this happen. They want to go stepwise so that it's not too disruptive, but it will be disruptive. It's going to be, as you say, Eugene, some hard choices, some difficult things, and we're going to lose some things and not get them replaced. Um, we don't know what those look like yet. Some things are very problematic to, to replace, and they may not go away any, any, anytime soon. But alternatives will hopefully emerge out of the ecosystem of our world that says, you want these easy to consume, single use items, drinks, well, they're going to come this way rather than that way, and that's going to change. And it, I, we'll get we'll we'll get there, but you know, we could move a little faster. Thanks. <laughs> yes, and I think we all know we can move pretty fast when we have to because we've learned that in the last yes. year. So yes. change can happen, yes. and we can adapt, and um, and and we can make it happen. So um, I know this group. We can talk about this. Um, for the next couple of decades, because we have so much information. Um, but I see time is of essence and people have um, 
things to do. Um, I know Zari had to go back to work. So I just yeah. wanted to thank you Amy, all. Amy, sorry, there's one yeah, question there that course. we should answer. Um, of course. Is the session taped? Yes, absolutely. The YouTube um, it, presentation is available going forward for as long as you want to use it. She was thinking about schools and it would be a good reference tool. Yes, it Perfect. will be available on this link for the future for the foreseeable future. Sorry to stop there, yeah. Yes, no, thank you. That's very important to make note of. Um, and just to um, wrap up and just to uh, echo Joycelyn Morris and one of the audience members, um, Thank you all. Um, really important information. I really appreciate all the work that you do in our community on this important topic. Um, and just to uh, re-echo this quote, each one reach one, each one teach one. And we all have a part to play as individuals and as a community together. Um, so thank you for your time and all your thank wonderful you. information. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.